and I hope that you will all welcome, all join me in welcoming our great Chairman of Appropriations, Mr. Terry England. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good to be with you all today. I notice the crowd's a little slimmer now since Will and everybody got finished with all the inspirational stuff. I guess y'all thought that budget's pretty boring. Well, we do a little budget presentation every year uh, to the State Fiscal Managers Conference, and it's, it is kind of boring stuff. So we try to jazz it up just a little bit, try to make it a little bit interesting. And that's what we're going to do here this morning. We're going to use one that we did back in uh, September of last year that it's been updated a little bit, but I want to first thank Gretchen for the, the kind and wonderful introduction here this morning. Good to be with everybody. Uh, it's good to be in Georgia. It's good to be a Georgian. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've had the opportunity now to represent my home for 12 years in the General Assembly, and we're up for a primary election this year, and hopefully we'll get to do it another two years. Everybody says, well, we need term limits, and I say, well, we've got them. We get hired every two years for two years, and at that, you know, the contract's up. So, but, um, you know, I enjoyed listening to Will a little bit ago and, and the challenges that he presented everybody here and, and talking about Matt's white paper. Uh, I was sitting in that room when that was all kind of rolled out and saw the reaction of some folks there that morning and, and was a little bit disappointed because it's something that, that I've, thought for years is something we need to be doing. We need to be utilizing all of the assets that the citizens of this great state have put in our hands to educate young people. And quite frankly, it, it disappointed me that, that there are some that, that don't see it that way. As a business person, uh, as we look at buying equipment, look at buying fixtures, furnishings, all that sort of stuff for, for a retail operation like we were in, you know, my, my goal there is to use something and use it to its fullest extent. And that's kind of the idea of the discussion we've had for several years, and Matt and I have had it on numerous occasions, talking about why aren't we using the assets we have on an almost around-the-clock basis, because we have adult learners that are willing to come in and learn early in the mornings, stay late in the evenings. We've got the block of students that are in the middle. And uh, why, not, why not use those assets? to the best of our ability. But anyway, it's one of those ideas that I think eventually we will see fruition come to. It's just changing that paradigm, changing that, that mindset of doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result, which y'all know what that is. Anybody? Insanity, okay, thank you. So let's get started with the, uh, with the slideshow. The budget games. I told you we have to do something to make it a little bit entertaining because, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it, as I said a minute ago, the nuts and bolts of, of budgeting is pretty boring. Um, but we want to jazz it up just a little bit and talk about some of the things that we do, some of the reasons we do some of the things we do. And, you know, it is interesting. We have a little over 10 million folks in the, in the state now. And so it's our job in the House and in the Senate we let them play a little bit too. Uh, but it's our job to appropriate the dollars. And it's really the only, or not really, it is the only thing that the Constitution of the state of Georgia says that we have to do during a session. We're there for 40 days, but our number one job is to pass a budget. And as Gretchen had mentioned a few minutes ago, we do two budgets a year. We do the, the amended mid-year uh, adjustment budget, a lot of times called the baby budget. And then we do the, the big budget for the upcoming fiscal year. And a lot of times I kind of liken it to uh, sitting out in a boat from Great Britain to come to New York City. That's kind of what the big budget is. When the, the ship takes sail and it's going across the water, then the amended budget process, as we go to wrap up the, the, the finishing up of the fiscal year, winds up kind of being... I liken to uh, getting the boat into that harbor and getting it safely up to the dock. And that's what our job is, is to, to get that little budget done first, and then we look at the big budget as we go from there. 
So legislative session is 40 days. We start the second Monday of January each year. Uh, different speakers and different leadership have, have done different things as far as how the legislative clock is, is run out. Uh, Speaker Murphy, I understand, used to enjoy letting the, the clock run on weekends, so the days ticked off on the weekends so he could make it to spring practice down in Florida. Uh, over the last several years, though, in the entire 12 years I've been there, we typically do stop the clock on the weekends. We're there uh, typically Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday. Uh, understand that the one thing you need to understand, and I think most of you do, is that we are a, a part-time citizen legislature. And so we have doctors and lawyers and CPAs and feed store owners and everything else that are there during the week and we have to get back home to take care of our own business, to feed our own families. So we do put those little breaks in every once in a while to do that. Uh, the longest legislation, legislative session we had was in uh, 2011. Being a farm supply retailer selling plants and seed and fertilizer uh, about drove me nuts because I like to get back to the store. At that point, I like to get back to the store uh, mid, mid to late March because by April 29th the planting season was over and all the customers were gone so it, it, it was kind of boring when I got back that year but anyway as I said a minute ago the budget is the only piece of legislation that that has to be done and if you remember I guess it was in 2004 the General Assembly adjourned with an unbalanced budget and Governor Purdue at that time called them back into special session and thankfully I wasn't there but uh, did know a lot of folks that were, were not happy about that, unfortunately. But we do have to pass a balanced budget. Now, a lot of folks ask questions about, will you borrow money? Well, we do. We borrow money for capital outlay projects. Your campuses, K-12 schools, our, our university system, we borrow money for those things. We borrow money to build roads and bridges. But to operate the state of Georgia, it is strictly on a cash basis. We do not borrow money to do that. The governor, uh, usually within the first five days of session, will take and lay out his budget proposal to us. This year it was a little over 400 pages in a ring-bound notebook of a lot of suggestions, as some of my colleagues call it. But uh, we, we have really enjoyed, I have really enjoyed over the last six years working very close with Governor Deal and his staff to craft the budgets that we've worked on. We've came, come through some very hard times. Um, as I took on the chairmanship in, in 2011, we were kind of at the, the worst spot in the recession. Uh, we'd, we'd adopted a budget in 2008 for the 2009 fiscal year of about $21.5 billion. Uh, before we were out of town good, Governor Purdue at the time had to start making some very strong cuts as we knew the economy was starting to head south very quickly. And as it amounted to, we wound up making about $4 billion in cuts uh, to get down to about a $17.5 billion budget uh, by the time everything kind of bottomed out. Uh, we did use quite a bit of, of the rainy day fund. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, we also used quite a, quite a few dollars of stimulus funds as well to kind of soften that blow. Had we not done those things, had we not used the rainy day fund, the budget cuts we would have seen would have probably been closer to about six and a half billion dollars. That's billion with a B. Um, we do the joint hearings, usually the second week we're in session. Uh, it's usually the, the week of the Martin Luther King uh, Junior holiday week, that Monday. We come back in on Tuesday and start our joint committee hearings. Uh, most of our, our very large uh, state agencies. There are about 11 state agencies that are very large in the state that take up the vast majority of the state's budget. We can eliminate 39 other agencies and save less than a billion dollars. So that gives you an idea of how big those other 11 are. Of course, the first thing we, we go to work on in the House is passing the amended budget, and then we begin working on the next upcoming fiscal year budget. Uh, we like to try to finish up the amended bill and get it out of the House, get it to the Senate, let the Senate get it back to us in time that we can have it sewn up and put to bed before we pass the big budget out, just in case there's some 
adjustments that have to be made at the last minute. Of course, the Senate has a, a 30 day crossover rule. And y'all have heard of crossover day. It's one of the two longest days during a session. The, the longest typically is, is day 40, the day we adjourn sine die. But day 30 is the last day that a bill from the House can go to the Senate and be heard or that a bill can come from the Senate to the House and be heard. Budget does not fall under that. However, we typically are, are well ahead of that schedule in getting the big budget out. Our Housey Wood Squares. And uh, we're, I have the opportunity to work with some wonderful people. And uh, Chairman Butch Parrish from down around Swainsboro, he, he heads up our health subcommittee. Chairman Tom Dixon from up at Cahutta chairs our K-12 subcommittee. Uh, Chair Lady Dempsey from up in Rome, she heads up our human services. Andy Welch is uh, from down around the Griffin McDonough way down that way, heads up public safety. Miss Penny Houston takes care of economic development for us and a lot of things fall into the economic development category. And you, some of them you might not think of. The Department of Ag, for instance, is one that falls into the department or under her subcommittee, but if you think about it, it's the largest industry in the state. It is economic development. Chairman Earl Earhart, one of y'all's biggest fans, and, and uh, he chairs up our higher ed subcommittee and takes care of TCSG, takes care of USG, uh, student finance, and many of the things that make your job something that, that's able to happen. Miss Amy Carter from up at Valdosta, or down at Valdosta. I guess it'd be up at Valdosta if we were in Ocala, but we're not. So, uh, but Amy, uh, she is a high school teacher and loves her job, loves her job of teaching and interacting with the kids. And if you've ever met her, you know that she's just a bundle of energy and, and runs wide open. She takes care of our general government, a lot of our smaller agencies. She may, she may handle the least amount of dollars of anybody up there, but she by far handles the most agencies of anybody up there because there are a lot of small agencies that fall under her category. Tic-tac-doe, 78 committee members. Uh, we are the largest committee in the House. Of course, we've got 180 House members, so we're not quite at half, almost at half. And typically, we do not appoint freshmen to the Appropriations Committee. We would like for folks to come in, get their feet wet, learn where the restrooms are, uh, understand a little bit about how, how the process works before we want them to come on the Appropriations Committee because we're gonna put them to work when they come on the committee. Uh, one exception that, I'm, that I, I can remember is a fellow that you may know, uh, it's Gretchen's colleague over at the university system, Hank Huckabee. Hank had uh, actually been director of OPB, the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, uh, under Governor Miller. And so when Hank ran and was elected to the House, the Speaker came to me and said, well, I'm going to do something you might not like. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to put a freshman on your committee. And I'm like, oh, boss, what's up? And he says, well, I think you'll understand why this particular freshman is going to be on your committee. So it, it made sense. And... Hank's brief career that they had with us there in the house for about three months, we trained him up, sent him on to be chancellor of the university system, and the rest is history. <laughs> Our subcommittee chairs take the budget that comes from the governor, the governor's proposed budget, then they start having subcommittee hearings. Most of the subcommittees, as I said, we have 78 members. Most of the subcommittees, though, are less than 10 people, have seven subcommittees, and their job is to really dive into the weeds of each of the program area budgets and look at the things and hear from the folks that, that receive services from agencies, hear from TCSG, university system, hear from K-12 folks and help us understand if there's a new program that's coming along that we need to, to, to put funding in for or if there's changes, something that's being done differently or even you know enrollment growth. And, you know, it's been kind of a challenging time with enrollment growth as, as the economy has started to rebound a little bit. Uh, Y'all have seen probably some of your numbers drop just a little bit because people are going back to work. The great thing about that, that means you did your job. That's the way I look at it, is that if folks are going back to work, if they come to you, got training in a new area or figured out a new career, that means you've done your job. So don't hang your head when enrollment numbers drop a little bit because that means folks are going back to work. That means you've taught them a skill that they can use. So 
I, I, I like to see that happen, actually, because that means that Georgia is working again. The subcommittees will vote out the recommendations. Then we have this little secret conclave called Green Door. And Green Door, the legend goes back several decades. We're not really sure where the Green Door is. Not sure that anybody at the Capitol knows where the Green Door was. But uh, one of our little things we like to do to, to new folks on the, the chair of the subcommittees, our subcommittee chairs are all in Green Door. Basically, it's a leadership update or briefing for our House Speaker, Speaker Pro Tem, Majority Leader, those folks that are, that are leaders in the House to help them understand what our recommendations are going to be as a full committee. And so one of the little things we do to kind of spice things up, I'm, I'm a little bit of a practical joker myself. So this year we had a, a new subcommittee chairman, Andy Welch, that you saw his picture of a minute ago. Also had a new uh, full committee vice chairman, Chad Nimmer, from down at Jessup. And uh, I usually meet, Martha says, real early in the morning. I don't think it's that early. It's about 6.30 in my office in the mornings with those, with those folks, and we kind of go over things. One of the things that, that the old hats and I decided we were going to do is tell the two new guys that they need to, need to go see the speaker about a, a key to the green door. Well, those two fellas about worried the speaker half to death trying to find a key to the green door. Uh, we did ultimately let them in, but they didn't find a key. But uh, during the Green Door process, leadership, we have great communication with our, with our House leadership, and they're typically keeping us very updated with, with folks or entities or individuals that they're talking, talking to about different issues that for some reason we may not have talked to. And so a lot of times in Green Door, they'll bring up an issue that, that we may need to go back and, and do some type of adjustment on. And so after that, then we go to our final subcommittees, subcommittee meetings for them to report out. And then we have a full committee meeting where I walk through the budget and explain all the, all the expenditure changes from the governor's recommendation uh, to, to go to the floor of the House, then usually the next day after that. So a lot of opportunities for folks to have input. Um, I, I typically start midsummer hearing from individuals or, or groups and organizations that, that may have requests or needs, that sort of thing. So the summer and the fall is typically very full of those kind of things as well. So a lot of time for people to have input. Y'all look close. <laughs> he, he's never seen that and I hope he don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all cameras away, all cameras away. <laughs> Just kind of gives you an idea. And of course, uh, Governor Deal, bless his heart, kind of came in in that low point right there. Uh, and at that point that he came into office, um, we had spent the rainy day fund down from about a billion and a half dollars to, to about $50 million. Uh, and he has worked very diligently. We've, we've been proud to partner with him to build that rainy day fund back up. And we'll talk about it more here in just a minute. But this just kind of gives you an idea of, of the state general funds that are going into uh, the state budget. And this comes from, from the state personal income tax, corporate income tax, uh, sales tax, and, and the other uh, um, excise taxes on, on different things. So it gives you an idea of where we're at. We're a little over 21 or a little over 20 billion in general funds. Uh, full budget, a little over $24 billion, and if you put federal funds on top of it, just a little north of $40 billion total. So, this is one of those slides that gives me cold sweats and uh, makes me lose a little bit of sleep at night sometimes when I see, especially the bar to the right, the Medicaid enrollment growth, the, the, the percentage of the of what we're spending on health care as a state, as a country, is continuing to, to grow dramatically. You see how state general funds are growing at, a, at about a 10% rate, and it, it'll vary from day to day and year to year. Population has continued to grow. Enrollment in K-12, believe it or not, has started back growing. There, there was a point that enrollment growth in K-12 institutions back during the, the heart of the recession was less than 1%. But you see university system enrollment growth is, is ticking back up, but Medicaid enrollment growth 
over that period of time from, from fiscal year 08 to 17 has made a dramatic, dramatic increase. It's the number two category in the state budget for the dollar, total dollar spent. When you look at K-12 and higher ed together, we're a little over 52, 53% total of all state funds. Medicaid comes in a, 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 a little bit distant second, but not that much of a distant second. Kind of breaking the dollars down uh, by policy area. Look, slide on the left is, is fiscal year 08. Uh, as we started into the recession, fiscal year 17 on the right, the budget that we adopted is, as we left Atlanta. You'll see those numbers have, many of the numbers have remained fairly constant. Uh, public safety is still about 8.5%. General government services has grown just a little bit. Of course, during that period of time, we've, or excuse me, has, has dropped just a little bit. During that period of time, between 08 and 17, we've added almost a million new citizens in the state of Georgia. Uh, economic development and transportation, uh, it's grown a good bit, but the transportation bill we passed last year, dedicating more funding to our roads and bridges across the state is part of that reason. And when you take 100% and divide it up by several areas, some things move and adjust, and you'll see education came down just a little bit, but a lot of that is because of the growth in transportation funding. Our bond ratings. Now, I mentioned a while ago that we can borrow money, but we can only borrow money for capital projects. And capital projects are those things that you feel and touch. It's buildings, vehicles, equipment, all of those things that make you able to do your job back at your local technical college. It's the things that get people around this state. It's the roads, bridges, and highways. It's those institutions where those kindergartners that Will was talking about a while ago come into, those buildings. So you'll see at the bottom on that slide, higher education in uh, K-12 and then economic development the dollars that are spent there through the bonding process. Typically, we, we count the bonds at about $950 million a year. Uh, one of the things that, that we're proud of and have been proud of and something we held on to during the recession, which is not something a lot of other states could say, was our AAA bond rating from all three credit rating agencies across the country. What does that mean? That means that when we go to borrow money, for these capital projects that we borrow it a lot cheaper than a lot of our other states do because they don't have the credit rating that we do. It's something that Georgia has taken pride in for many years. Uh, at one point during the recession there were five AAA rated states. I think we've been up to 11 in the last 18 months. We're back down to nine at this point. Uh, several others have been put on notice of possible downgrades. Uh, a lot of our oil producing states they're seeing revenues drop considerably, and they're focused, a lot of their revenue is focused directly on oil production, so they're starting to fall out a little bit as well. The price is right. Of course, y'all know Mr. Ken Hegany is a state economist. I always think he's going to have a big S right there on his chest, like Superman, because he's the one that has to sit down and, and figure it out. He has to figure out what the revenue estimate is going to be. In Georgia, it's kind of, we're kind of unique. We have a very powerful government, governor, and the governor is the one charged in the Constitution with setting the revenue estimate. He's the one that decides how much money the state has to spend on, in any given year. And we have to balance to that. We can't spend a penny more. We can spend a penny less. We can spend several million less if, if we want to, but there's always more demands than there are dollars. So Ken, and a group of economists, we sat down usually in uh, late November, early December to set and hear their outlooks. And I will tell you that this past year when we met with them, it was the most optimistic I've ever seen a bunch of pessimistic folks ever be. Uh, they, were, they were actually very, very high on the prospects of Georgia's economy over the next couple of years, which is something I had never heard them say. But uh, they'll typically present the governor with three figures, a low, medium, and a high revenue estimate. Georgia governors through history, whether Republican or Democrat, have always tended to budget very conservatively. So they typically pick the low to the mid-range number. Well, 
The next logical question is, well, what if, it come, what if the revenue estimate comes in over that? Well, I mentioned the rainy day fund a few minutes ago. Those excess dollars roll into that rainy day fund. That's kind of, guys, how many of y'all have mad money in your billfold? How many has, ain't nobody going to admit it. <laughs> oh, you'll see me raise my hand. Um, the rainy day fund's kind of our mad money. It ticks me off to have to spend it. It's kind of like that $100 bill you got stuck back in your billfold. It ticks you off to have to spend it, but it's always nice to know it's there. And so the excess funds roll over into the rainy day fund. At the end of the fiscal year, as y'all know, you're all audited and you have to take and turn in any excess funds. Those funds as well go into the rainy day fund as well. Of course, the way we budget and the way with the revenue estimates, it prevents us from overspending as a state. Again, we can't run a deficit budget. We have to run an, an either balanced or a plus budget as far as having additional revenues versus expenses. So flat budgets. How many are familiar with flat budgets? Everybody in the room. You've all been told flat budgets. Well, and that's what we've seen for the last several years. At least they're not cut budgets. At least you're not being asked to bring a 2, 4, and a 6% cut plan or a 6, 8, and 10% cut plans as we saw in 08, 9, 10, and 11. So the pa this past year, what we budgeted on were flat budgets. Uh, the only allowments for growth were those things where uh, you had an, if you had enrollment growth, you are allowed to, to request funds for that. Uh, a lot of our human services that, are, that have more needs or, or more demands on services, they were allowed to, to ask for some additional funds, ask for additional people as well. One of the things we're starting to see is a very high turnover rate in the state, in our state employees. Uh, we're averaging about an 18% turnover rate right now. Uh, we have, over the last several years, began to target several areas of high turnover rates and trying to stabilize those workforces, whether it be DFACs, Department of Correction, prison guards, our DNR law enforcement rangers, our state troopers, those that we see that it cost us a great deal of money to train those individuals only to see them hired away by somebody else that can afford to pay them another four or $5,000 on a starting salary a year. So we're starting to try to rebound and rebuild some of those things. Again, the cap to mount for bond projects, just trying to manage within what the Constitution says. The Constitution allows us to use up to 10% of prior year revenues to cover debt service. Well, our debt management plan for the state says that we stay at eight or below. We have kind of a handshake agreement that we stay at seven or below, but we typically try to shoot for 6% or below of prior year revenues to go to debt service. So, that's the reason we, when I told you a minute ago, we cap it at about 950. That's the reason we do that. And that means a lot of projects don't get done in any particular year, but it's because we're trying to manage the state's resources and be wise stewards of your taxpayer dollars as we do that work. As I mentioned a while ago too, uh, since the use of the, of the reserves that we had to have in 08 and 09, Budget instructions for six of the past nine years have required a cut plan from departments. Thankfully, hopefully, please Lord, let that be over. We'll see. The $23 billion pyramid. As I mentioned a little bit ago, we're getting close to that $24 billion mark, or a little bit over it. Uh, you'll see those revenue sources. That's what this breaks down. It just kind of gives you an idea of where those revenue sources come from. And you know, we, we hear a lot of talk about individual income taxes, and you see that it's probably the, or is the largest category. But one interesting fact in Georgia is that we rank 50th in the country of the total tax burden on our citizens. So while the, the top rate for income tax is sitting at 6%, it still puts us at the very bottom of the list for how much you pay in to the state in taxes in any given year. The bond rating agencies love seeing this spread. They love seeing this mix. And every year, uh, as they do the bond review for the state, then they tell us that we like seeing a very balanced revenue stream coming into the state of Georgia. 
A lot of those other states that I mentioned that are put on notice for possible downgrades, they concentrate heavily in one area or another area for those revenues that they get. So what's my line? You'll see there, um, kind of going over the last several years, going back to 2003, gives you an idea of where sales tax has been. You see in 06 and 07, sales tax was continuing to grow, and that was right before the recession hit. Of course, you see right after that, as the recession hit, those numbers started dropping. The same with, with uh, individual income tax. Corporate income tax stayed relatively flat. The one thing that, that I always look at, and having been a former retailer, of course, sales taxes, if I was paying a lot in in sales tax every month, that meant we were having a very good month. If we were not paying very much in in sales tax every month that we'd collect, that meant we were having a very bad month. But one of the interesting things we've seen this go round as we've started recovering is that individual income tax has started growing fairly dramatically, fairly fast, but yet sales tax was remaining relatively flat. And a couple of things are the reason for that, and particularly if you looked at 16 and, and going into 17 projections, uh, as we pulled 1% of state sales tax, there have been, there's four, four penny, it used to be four pennies of sales tax charged on motor fuel. Three of those were going to transportation, one was going to the general fund. And in House Bill 170 last year, as we changed around the transportation funding in the state, we pulled that fourth penny and put it back into transportation, about $160 million going back into transportation. They've not been there before. So that's part of the reason that it's staying a little bit flat beyond 15 and 16. But at the same time, the interesting thing that you see is that individual income tax has been rising fairly dramatically especially when you compare it to sales tax and the rate of increase on sales tax. A couple of things it tells me. It tells me that people are rat-holing or putting a little mad money back themselves. It tells me that individuals are starting to maybe save a little bit of money, maybe pay down some debt that they incurred during uh, the, the recession. All in all, still a very strong uh, revenue stream coming into the state. Uh, we're still running ahead of projections so and look to for the next couple of years at least in, in the short run. So Wheel of Fortune, those two individuals, many of you may know them, some of you may not. On the right, Chris Riley, the Governor's Chief of Staff, and on the left, Teresa McCartney, the Director of OPB. And so I think it's kind of apropos that we use Wheel of Fortune there because a lot of folks, I think, when they go to talk to those two about funds, feel like they're spinning the Wheel of Fortune to see what they're going to get and just hoping it doesn't land on bankrupt. So, but uh, the two of them, Chris and I and Teresa, have all grown to, to be good friends outside of the capital, but it's, it, that, that just means that we have that much better of a relationship inside the capital when we're working there. And two of the finest servants in the state that I know of, and Chris, I wonder sometimes if he ever sleeps and sometimes I wonder if Teresa can, can sleep because of the things that are on her shoulders that she has to take care of. So the wheel, 2017, breaking down that pie chart I showed you a little bit earlier, a little bit more. And I mentioned a while ago the debt management on the bonds, and you'll see there in 17 it's 5.07. So remember I said 10%, 8%, handshake at 7%. And we try to keep it below six, so we're, we're there. We, we did bump up a few years ago in the heat of the recession as revenues fell off and we were still borrowing some fairly large bond packages. But you'll see that education still remains very strong. Our investment in, in the young people and, and old people alike that are going back to school at 53.31%. This is an interesting slide we kind of stumbled on a few years ago. Just got to looking, we had, you know, you get these pie charts and they're on different pieces of paper and it was kind of funny, me and Martha were looking at it one day and I said, you know, it's kind of odd that they almost look the same, but it's two totally different subjects. But it is, when you look at it, as I mentioned, the income taxes a while ago, basically equal about what education, what we spend on education in the state. When you look at fees, it's about what debt management is. Public safety is the other fees and taxes. Sales tax is about what we spend on, on health. 
Uh, general government, lottery, of course, those two don't, don't mix, but at the same time, the sources and, and the amounts are, are relatively close. And then when you look at, at uh, economic development versus motor fuel, which a large part of economic development means getting goods and services and people around this state, those numbers match up fairly close as well. So, who wants to be a millionaire? No hands? Well, I can't see you with these lights on anyway, so it don't matter. <laughs> these are the four agencies that have the largest budgets, uh, state fund budgets in the state. And you've got education at $8.9 billion, and that's, that's dealing with K-12. Community health, I mentioned Medicaid and, and health expenditures a while ago, $3.2 billion. Board of Regents at 2.1 and in transportation at 1.7. If Gretchen has her way, TCSG is going to be up there somewhere between A and B at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Quick story. It's time for a laugh. So I get to travel the state a lot and enjoy it. I've got a good friend that has a little place outside of Moultrie and we go down and visit it every once in a while just to kind of get away. Uh, try to do it in cool season so the gnats are not there. But anyway, over there the other day, and we, we go to a little place. Anybody know where Funston, Georgia is? Nobody. Oh, oh one hand, a couple of hands. Know where Fun Everybody know where the Funston Cafe? If you've been through Funston, you know where the cafe is. It's one of two buildings. So sitting there early one morning, we're eating breakfast, and a group of farmers always gather there, so we're sitting around shooting a bull and hoping he lives and everything. A little guy comes flying over on one of those ultralights. Just well, you, you can kind of see past the cotton gin looking out of the cafe. Well, the guy lands just the other side of the cotton gin. Well, one of the boys sitting there, he runs out in the truck and gets a deer rifle out. You know, about three good shots. Well, the fellow just goes running off from it. And so we all run out there and say, man, what are you doing? He says, well, I just, that, that thing had him. So, well, what is it? He says, well, I don't know, but when I shot at it, it turned that feller loose. So, <laughs> so, do you need a lifeline? I hope not. I hope uh, that you'll see that, that the upcoming budget, that, uh, again, we're, we're optimistic about what we're seeing in the state as far as revenues are, are concerned. You'll see the, the breakdown of what I was talking about a while ago. And it's amazing to me how much money is spent in just a few categories, what a large percentage of the budget is spent in just a few categories in our state. But it, it you know, the old saying is, you put your money where your heart is, and that's what we've done. That's what we as a state do, with maybe the exception of Department of Corrections. I don't guess we've really got our heart there, but, you know, it is one of those things that we have to do in order to keep our families safe and our state safe. I will tell you, though, that over the last couple of years, with the criminal justice reform package that Governor Deal has, has really been proactive in pushing, it is starting to make a tremendous difference in what we're seeing expenditure-wise and individual-wise in our corrections department. We're seeing people that we were mad at but not afraid of actually get a second chance. And that means that they're able to come to your institutions and get an education. That means they're able to provide for their families. That means that when they're providing for their families, they become taxpayers that turn around and support your institutions and support us as a state. One little one little barometer of what I look at to tell me that criminal justice reform is, is working in the state. As many of you know, your local county sheriffs house a lot of state prisoners from time to time. And three years ago, we pay a county jail subsidy. So every prisoner earns X number of dollars that's paid to that county jail for that state prisoner being in that sheriff's custody for an extended period of time. Three years ago, we were spending over $21 billion on that one thing alone. So far this year, we've spent less than $1,000. $21 million to $1,000, less than $1,000. It's 
So criminal justice reform is working. The things that Buster is doing to help these folks that are in prison learn a trade and get educated, get their GEDs, so when they come out, they have the ability to go get a job. Those are the kind of things that we've got to think about and learn and do differently. As Matt had mentioned a while ago, and as Will had mentioned, we've got to do things differently. A lot of folks are a little bit nervous about criminal justice reform in this state, but it's truly transforming lives of individuals that made, a lot of them made just simple mistakes. Now those that we're afraid of, yeah, we're going to keep them locked up. But those that we're mad at, we're going to get over and give them another chance. That's what we're supposed to do. Family Feud, the conference committee. Oh, the conference committee. Long nights of eating peanuts in my office, sitting there trying to hash out the differences between the House and the Senate versions of the budget. As I said a while ago, we send the big budget over to the Senate. We send the amended budget over to the Senate. And for whatever reason, they change stuff. We send it to them perfect, and they change stuff. But anyway, in all seriousness, both chambers do have their priorities. Our House has a certain set of priorities that our members are interested in. The Senate has its own set of priorities. And so they'll, they'll bring the budget back or send the budget back to us with differences. And so at that point, it goes to a conference committee where we sit down. Senator Hill on the left has is, is grown to be a very good friend of, of, of mine, ours. And I've, I've really enjoyed working with him over the last six years in his role as Senate Appropriations Chairman and my role as House Appropriations Chairman. And we spend literally tens and twenties and thirties and forties of hours around a little table in my office, sitting there trying to figure out how to balance the state's budget. And quite frankly, our biggest dis disagreements or discussions sometimes come on those items that are $50,000 or less. And you're thinking, well, a $24 billion budget, but you're sitting there arguing over $50,000. But quite frankly, a lot of times those little items like that make a tremendous impact on individuals across the state. It can be, a homeless shelter or a battered women's shelter somewhere in the state of Georgia that another five or $600 a year or $1,500 a year means the difference in providing services to, to 200 folks versus 50 folks. It's those kind of things. That, that's, when it's all said and done, those are the things I kind of go back and look at as, as the things I'm proudest of when we're doing the budget. It's those little things that we know have a face-to-face or a person-to-person -person impact on someone. So, again, new revenue in 17 was about $1.9 billion. Um, economic development and transportation took up a large portion of that, about 43.5% education, student enrollment growth in K-12, TCSG and, and university system, about 35%. Public safety, uh, that figure does include some additional funds for our state troopers. I mentioned a little while ago about high turnover rates. And so that figure is including a, an additional bump for those guys trying to keep them on the road protecting us and, and lower that turnover rate. Discretionary versus non-discretionary spending. Now everybody in this room thought we went and fussed about $24 billion, didn't you? No. We fuss about 18.6% of that amount of money. The non-discretionary things are a QBE funding formula for K-12 education. The funding formula for TCSG, Regents, Medicaid, all of those things that you think about that automatically happen, whether we want them to or not, or whether, whether we've got a choice or not, those things happen. The 18.6 is what we have left to divvy up among a lot of different things and those include things like pay raises and just various and sundry other things as well. So, naked and afraid, do y'all recognize those folks? Look close, all right, come on. <laughs> Mad I told you. <laughs> I know it. I got him last week, it was his birthday. We were having a welding for him and Nobody was brave enough to say anything about his birthday, but he, 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 I got to. 
Anyway, zero-based budgeting. And that does make a lot of folks feel naked and afraid when they hear that. And what we instituted zero-based budgeting back several years ago. And uh, leadership of the governor and leadership of, of both uh, chambers of the General Assembly, it's something we'd looked at for several years wanting to do. And that's looking at, at what your core expenditures are, what it costs you to do business on a daily basis, and looking at it and helping us figure out if there are things that the state doesn't need to be in the business of doing. Are there things out there that the private sector should be doing that the state's been doing for 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 years, and we just did it because we've always done it? Zero-based budgeting has helped us identify some of those things that the private sector, quite frankly, does better than we do on the state level. So we've seen that happen over the last several years. About 69% of, of the 227 particular entities in the state um, have been done. Uh, excuse me, 227 of the 328 particular entities have been done. Uh, and by the end of, I guess, next year, all will have gone through the seven-year process and it'll start over again. Also, we have the opportunity as the House Appropriations Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee and the governor as well to, to request performance audits. Our state auditor, Greg Griffin, is, is great to work with as well, and, and his team will go in a lot of times. If we've got a program or something we've been working with and we can't just quite get our hands around it and understand what's going on or if something just feels a little bit of a, a miss, then we can ask Greg and his team to go in and do a performance audit on that particular agency or that particular program. Again, ZBB, bearing it all. You know, it, it, it gets a little bit frustrating because we do get these recommendations coming out of ZBB. And ZBB looks at things basically on a numbers only basis. It, don't, it doesn't have the ability to really look at things on a personal basis or a, a I don't want to say feel good basis, but y'all understand what I'm talking about. So a lot of times it's just kind of a blunt cut and dry report. But what it allows us to do, it gives us the opportunity then to look at that report and again decide if it's something we need to continue doing or not. A lot of times it'll find code updates that we need to make. A lot of times there are code sections that have been out there for 50 or 60 years that nobody's looked at, but all of a sudden during ZBB we realize, well, TCSG's been doing something for 30 years that code says they can't, but it makes sense to do, so we need to fix that. So a lot of those kind of things it allows us to do as well. And then it allows us also a lot of times to find savings uh, throughout the state agencies. Tax exemptions, I'm speeding up because I know my time's getting short. Tax exemptions, of course, many of you know what a lot of those are. Uh, we all get to take advantage of the food sales, tax exemption, our personal exemption on income tax. Uh, retirement Social Security on senior citizens in Georgia is exempt as well. Prescriptions are exempt, our standard deductions, and several other things. And it goes on into uh, electricity, our energy used in manufacturing, an exemption we passed a few years ago that we've been told by Caterpillar and Baxter both that that is the reason that they chose Georgia was because we did those two exemptions or did that exemption. That's the reason the two of those companies came. You can always find what we're doing online. It amazes me what's available on the internet today, but uh, you can find the current budgets. You can go back several years and look at budgets as well uh, at any of these addresses. The easiest way a lot of times is go to this one simple address, www.legis.ga.gov. Click on the House of Representatives tab. It'll take you to where most of these things are. You can also watch our committee meetings. The House televises all of our standing committee meetings. So you can go on and see what we're doing during session. And a lot of times during the off season, if a committee's in town meeting, those will be televised as well. So, are you smarter than a fifth grader? I hope you are. I doubt I added anything to it though. But um, it, I, I just wanna say at it, it, it this, this kinda wraps me up on, on the presentation. I hope that you've learned something here today seriously. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you do in our communities. Y'all are key to economic development 
in this state. I think you know that. I hope you know that. If you don't know that, then you need to go take a class somewhere and understand that. But you all are key. When we're talking to companies around the, around the world, Gretchen and I have been to China and everywhere else. Thankfully, she knows how to speak a little bit of languages that I don't. I got two down pretty well, redneck and English, so I can, I can handle that. <clears throat> but as we travel the world with our governor when he goes on a trade mission, one of the biggest selling points we have is what exactly you all do. And that's our technical college system of Georgia. I would say probably even more so than our university system because companies know that if they locate to Georgia, that through our quick start programs that, that are housed with you all, that they know that they can get employees up and running and ready to go at the drop of a hat. And without y'all, that would not be possible. So thank you. Thank you for what you mean to my community. Uh, thank you to the, the crowd from Lanier Tech. I can't see you wherever you are, but thank you all for what y'all mean to, to Winder and Barra County and what y'all have done to improve our community and give folks in, our, in my community, in my home, hope for the ability to go out and get a well-paying job and raise their families and be successful. So thank you and God bless.